All right, welcome to World the Bible Class. Pastor Brian Wolf, you there, St. Paul, Jesus, Death, Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas, studying the life of Jacob with Martin Luther. Let's look at the text. So uh, here we are uh, in um, Genesis 29. And the thing that we're, the thing that Luther's been talking about for a long time, and it's, and it's quite wonderful, is that, uh, uh, that, that, that this, the, there's this little, all these domestic notes. You have the well with the stone, and you have this family, and you, whoa, what's going on? I've lost control of the pen. Wow. Wowzers. Uh, and you have, uh, and you have these, so all this kind of little domestic stuff, Luther says, even the Greeks, when they write about their heroes, they don't write about all this sort of stuff. And the point is that God is, in fact, particularly interested in the small stuff when when by faith he's he's claimed us as his own. So we'll start here. Luther's going to pick up on this theme that we've been working on already. But And we also, and I hope this was helpful for you all, we looked last week at the at Luther's freedom of the Christian and, uh, and, and how Luther talks this way about how it's like marriage. When, when you're married, whatever belongs to one belongs to the other. And, and all the details of life are, are kind of wrapped up together. Well, so, so he says, therefore faith and the person who is in grace are to be considered for such an abundance of divine goodness has been poured out on us that God numbers and observes even the least of our works. Whatever they are or whatever nature they are in the end, they are all praiseworthy and pleasing because the person is pleasing. Now, this has to do with our doctrine of uh, vocation. So what is our calling? What is our, what is our vocation? What is our... Um, I mean, you know what I want to do? Sorry, I, I just... Ah, I was just going to turn off the waiting room because if people come in, I got to go click on it and, and, but I, I but I can't turn it off. Okay. So anyway, th and a lot of people have noted, especially, so this might be true for some of you, which I'd love to hear from. If you've come into the Lutheran church from other traditions, this idea of Martin Luther's understanding of vocation is a particularly comforting and profound insight. And it, and it's something like this. It's not just our, our holy churchy kind of works that are pleasing in God's sight. But in fact, it's the works that uh, that we do in our day-to-day -day stuff that the Lord also considers these to be holy. There's some famous Luther quote, which I, I don't know if he ever said it, but that God is more pleased with the mom in the middle of the night changing the diaper than he is with the soldiers conquering countries or the monks praying all through the night or whatever, because they're doing works of love and service to the neighbor. But underneath that doctrine of vocation, this is this is one of the reasons why it's, we might, and we might miss it. Let me look at you guys. It's, it's not that like the Lord doesn't have a hierarchy of works. It's that the Lord considers the person more than the work. So when we, by faith, have the righteousness of Christ, when we by faith are joined to Jesus, when we by faith are, are justified, then, then even the slightest thing that we do brings with it that holiness. Just like we say that the least work of God is the greatest work because it's God who does it, he gives that same dignity then also to us. So when the person is right when the person is holy when the person is good by faith when the when the person is accepted that when the person is pleasing then whatever the works are they also become pleasing so it's person and and, and then the work it's the the picture is of uh remember that jesus gives us this beautiful picture of the tree and the uh, the fruit so he says okay first you have so you have the tree do, 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 and then then the tree has its fruit. Uh, what fruit? Oranges. Okay. So if you have a bad tree, then you have bad fruit. A good tree is uh, the result is good fruit. So our concern has to be not for the fruit, but for the tree. And that's the tree is the person. Really, sometimes in the scripture, it's the heart. And then the fruit of the works comes out. 
fine. But if the Lord delights in the tree, then th that's what he delights in. Got it. See? All right. Now, we are all together here. Nor does the judgment of the flesh have a place here. The flesh says that these matters pertain to some profane writer as though they were unworthy of sacred chronicles. Yes, that not even the Greek or Latin authors would think it fit to celebrate such matters concerning their heroes, for they do not understand what a life of godliness is, what things are pleasing, what things are displeasing to God. As the well-known saying puts it, away with a god lest he see the glory of God. Which I remember, but I'm trying to remember if I remember this because I don't think we studied it last week, but... I must have looked at it a few weeks in a row. So if I'm re if I'm rehashing material, then you guys let me know because I read it ahead of time and then go back. I'm not now, he, but here, so, okay. Let me hone in on one quick thing here on this paragraph that, that uh, the, the flesh, whoops, the, the judgment of reason would look at this text and say, well, this isn't even worthy of like a Greek poet, much less God. And 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 let it be just kind of sink into us that the Lord wants himself to be known as a writer. It's one of the big things, I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks, how the higher critical approach to the scriptures, which say that that it's written by men, politically motivated men uh, to try to make their case, and it wasn't written by God. They take away from God the vocation of author. But God wants to be known as an author. That's an important, I think that's an important little piece of information. And, and that God's writing is the, the, the word, that he is choosing the words. And when he's choosing the words, he's showing us what in fact is important to him. Now, you can read the histories of the world, and you read about all these great people who did these great works and these great monumentous things. And then you go to the Bible, and you read about these humble, lowly people. I mean, there's some heroes every now and again. I think there's some heroic things about David and some heroic things about Moses. But even there, it's this, it's this humble stuff. And reason says, what, why are we even studying the history of this guy getting married to these two women. What, what? And yet this is what the Lord is concerned about. And this teaches us. Therefore, we should read this with reverence and thank God that we know that we are pleasing to God. Even when we sleep, eat, drink, marry, when husbands, children, and wives live together, when we manage the household, when we milk the goats, <laughs> It's like Luther's kind of remembering the chores that he should have done that morning or something. <laughs> we should exercise ourselves in these matters, for they're just as great and wonderful as those sublime works. Why? Because they are done by a great person who believes and is an heir of the kingdom of heaven. If it pleases God, someday or hour will come when we will also do great heroic works. So leave it to God. Milk the goats and let the heroic endeavors come. Because you are this is a great person, a great person, uh, uh, an exalted person, a royal person. We're kings and priests in the kingdom of God. God has also depicted this will and good pleasure of his in the feeling of parents toward their children. So if you want an analogy of how the Lord thinks of us, Luther says, just think of how, just think of how the parents think of the kids. For in domestic sphere, we see that a father and mother are moved and delighted more if a little son or a little daughter brings a little flower or some other little thing than if a servant or maid brings a sack or a great beam. So, so Luther says, you know, if you're, do you think of the farm domestic, you got people who are working the farm and you got the kids and the kids bring to you a, a dandelion and the, and the, the worker brings a huge big sack of flour or whatever exhorts all this effort that parent is more happy with the gift that comes from the baby. Why? Those little works would be despised in servants and maids, but they're delightful and pleasing in children because there are children. Therefore describing the legends of hypocrites and monks is different from describing the legends of those who are truly saints. The former ridicule, the works of the whole life of the latter is impure. 
and they dream that they can placate God with their self-chosen and monstrous works. Here's Luther, who whose main foil, remember, is the monastery. And this is the idea that by self-chosen and monstrous, he identifies, which is actually true, works that God can be placated. It can be a sacrifice to make God happy. No. These works have been condemned by God, for they are not done by a person who is pleasing and acceptable. So that's the thing. Is the person pleasing and acceptable or not? And what follows then is the works. Okay? Now we're going to cruise on to the next. Let us uh, take a look at the rest. It's no less foolish and carnal in the judgment of the hypocrites. The new section follows, namely, how Jacob became a bridegroom. I like that language, by the way, of bridegroom. Better than groom, but bridegroom. It reminds us you have to have a bride, which used to be the, everyone used to know, but anyway. That's not the point. Verse 14, Laban said to him, surely your bone, you are my bone and my flesh, and he stayed with him a month. The beginnings are favorable, as usually happens in the case of hypocrites, but dun, dun, Duh, watch out, because Laban is going to prove himself to be a bit of a tricky guy. Throughout the history, Laban will be described as greedy and grasping man. And the name Laban agrees beautiful. It means white, like a whitewashed tomb, a hypocrite. Hypocrites, you see, have a great show of godliness, discipline, and morals, so that nothing seems saintlier, nothing more honorable, nothing more religious than they are. But it would have been more acceptable if the word would have been turned around and he had been called Nabal. Remember Nabal, the who's Nabal was the husband of uh, Abigail, and he almost got himself killed. But you see, he's playing on the words. You just you put the N first, and you put the L last. He just reverses the name Laban to Nabal. Accordingly, he displays great piety and love toward his cousin. That's Laban does towards Jacob. But in the meantime, he thinks, behold, I've obtained a very good and useful servant who will be compelled to do and bear everything according to my will. For he is a fugitive and an exile who's been able to find no other place with which to withdraw. So he's Laban's like, hey, welcome. So glad you're here. This is really great. But in the meantime, he's like, Ooh, you know, how can I juice this orange? How can I get everything I want out of him? He's poor, starving, naked in this prison. And with sufficiently strong bonds, he'll be detained in my house. For without me, he would have to perish of hunger. Yet at first he fawns on him as hypocrites usually do. You are my bone and my flesh, he says. He runs to meet him, embraces and kisses him as if he loved him in earnest and truly. But soon he betrays his hidden and faithless heart. Just as in other circumstances, a fish and a guest often become worthless after three days. My grandma used to say that. Mimi, fish and, fish and house guests stink after three days. <laughs> I guess she got it from Luther. Or maybe it's still common saying. Accordingly, Laban is described as a very pretentious hypocrite, so far as ex external works and words are concerned. Inwardly, however, he maintains idolatry, pride, greed, contempt for his neighbor. He considers only his own advantage. With such a fellow, the good and saintly man Jacob had to live. And observe, I ask you, how insignificant the beginnings of such great honors and of the dignity of this most eminent patriarch are. This patriarch, talking about Jacob, from whom so many kings... Uh, so many prophets, Christ himself, the apostles sprang in whose possession, uh, remember the apostles were also part of Israel and so forth, in whose possession was the whole majesty of eternal life, who was a king and a priest, who and who obtained the whole blessing from his father. But here, look, he's exceedingly poor and altogether downcast to such an extent that he has nowhere to set his foot. Indeed, this is creating man out of nothing. Ex nihilo. We we normally um is this how to spell nihilo? Ex nihilo. We normally think of ex nihilo out of nothing as uh creation, how God created the world, but Luther talks about it all the time. Even our faith, righteousness comes ex nihilo from nothing in ourselves. That's just how the Lord does it. So to lift up this man who's got nothing, here Jacob is just empty. Ah, uh, it's quite amazing. So Laban said to Jacob, because you're my kinsman, you should therefore serve me. Should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Jacob was with um, Laban one month. 
And during this time, he surely was not supported by him for nothing. Undoubtedly, he was not lazy. No, he did the work of a godly and faithful man, not only because he was impelled by poverty and need, but also because the Holy Spirit was in him. This is Luther just has this assumption that the Christian has the Holy Spirit, which means the Christian works hard. Our, our life is for, is for, is for, we're spending it. Uh, there's a, there's a danger that we get uh, for some reason, like we, our life is for preserving that, that work is the enemy or something like this. No, we want to, we just want to, I mean, we want to collapse across the finish line. This is my, here's my, my uh, football coach used to say this. You leave it all on the field. Do you, did your football coach say the same thing? Is that just a, you got to leave it all on the field. And so th this is how, this is how life is. We're just, we want to leave it all there. So, so Jacob has the Holy spirit. So he's working like crazy. He's just, he's getting after it. Okay. Every time I look at you, I have to reset all these buttons like this. Sorry. Someday I should be good at this. The zooms. Uh, the Holy Spirit moves saintly men to do honorable and godly service of every kind. God blesses these men that they may be useful to many. Joseph is an example. He's got nothing but food and clothing, yet he enriched his master, and that without any expectation of reward. It is undoubtedly such men about whom Paul says, Colossians 3, whatever your task, work heartily as serving the Lord and not men. Servants of this kind, uh, Jeanette says, the chess team coach said that. <laughs> Leave it all on the field. Okay. Whatever your task, work heartily, serving the Lord and not men. Servants of this kind who serve so faithfully that they do not please men but please God are very rare. But Jacob was a servant of this kind during that month as long as he served Laban. He was not lazy. He attended to his domestic duties of his own accord with the greatest diligence. He pastured the flocks, provided them with water, took care of all similar tasks as faithfully and as diligently as he could. But it pleased greedy Laban very much when he saw that Jacob devoted so much zeal and energy to his duties as a servant. Therefore, he immediately manages an agreement with him regarding wages. This is the highest commendation of Jacob's diligence and industry coupled with outstanding faithfulness. In other words, I got to pay you or someone else around here is going to get your work I'm not going to pay you what you deserve, but I'm going to pay you enough to keep you here. Truly, it is an outstanding and of rare, very rare virtue, especially among blood relations and kinsmen, where you would find very few who think that they should serve their kinsmen faithfully. It's an interesting thing that it's easier to be diligent at work out of the house than it is to be diligent at work in the house. Strange. For they think they have... Uh, so Joey asked, do you think Luther thought of himself as a man that worked that way to try to leave it all in the field? Yes. I mean, he, he, Luther, there's times in Luther's own life where he would just kind of faint from exhaustion. In fact, a faint, there's a famous episode. He preaches, it's a New Year's Eve sermon, a very famous sermon on Galatians, the until of Galatians 4, faith was a tutor. The law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. The law was a the law was a tutor until Christ came. Is that Galatians four, Galatians three, Galatians probably Galatians two. Anyway, he that New Year's Eve sermon. He preached the sermon on law and gospel, and he got out out of the pulpit, and then he fainted, just from exhaustion. He just he was he was teaching all these classes. He was traveling around. He was trying to, uh, Bugenhagen was out doing visits, so he was trying to pastor the church at St. Mary's. He's just threw, threw himself into his work. So that by time, when you, you can look in Halle, if you're coming to Germany with us this, this summer, you can see there's a death mask of Luther, and they took a cast of his hand, and his hand was, even in death, was shaped like it was holding the pin. Because uh, he was just, and so... Well, you guys know, you see all these, uh, do you see all the red books there? This is Luther's works. I have about, here in, at home, I have about um, two-thirds of Luther's works. But in the German, it's four times as many. It, it, by time Luther died, something like three-fourths of all the books printed in the printing press were by Luther. I mean, he just, he, he worked like crazy. That was his work to write. I've written a couple of books, and that is not so easy. 
And Luther would crank these things out three or four a year, just and amongst everything else. Crazy. Um, the, so Jill mentions devices. So talking about uh, phones and computers and everything. It's an interesting thing that these are meant to be an aid to work and to 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 kind of to be able to do more work and it ends up doing the opposite i uh i i heard someone say that nebuchadnezzar would have would have given his, his whole kingdom to have as much power as the normal person has in their smartphone like how many man servants is this the equivalent of this that that they're so that that there's so much to do it's an amazing thing to think of like i i wrote this little book on luther and the martyrs this i keep i kept i i gave away seven copies so i have to write keep on this one so you if you come to my house i'm i'll probably give it to you anyway but the, so it's just all the stuff that luther said about the martyrs and to read all of luther's stuff on the martyrs would have taken a lifetime but i can go and search the keywords and in zero seconds have a list of the seven thousand seven hundred times that luther's works mentions martyrs and whatever anyway i can we talk about that oh yeah so the idea you know we have this idea of um that you kind of work so that you can rest you know like and 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 you have a job so that you can retire. That's the that's the idea. I do not think that that is a Christian idea. I mean, so so at some point you are you have to rest. At some point you're tired, and like at some point in the day you're tired, and at some point in life you're tired, and so you have to rest. And and it should be that we honor those who have worked hard and need rest in the day, and in the week, and. I don't know how the monthly rest goes. We have a daily rest, we have a weekly rest, and we have a lifetime rest. In fact, heaven itself is described as a rest. They rest from their labors and their works follow them. But this is the time of this is the time of work. And so we want to do we we, we want to be after it. And especially probably in life, when we get to the when our bodies wear out, so it's difficult for us to whatever, do whatever we were doing when we were working. It's probably then that our real work begins. So that if you're retired, you're finally enlisted in the the front lines of spiritual warfare, especially if you're a grandma or a grandpa and you have your family. So praying for them, serving them spiritually, blessing them, that's probably the most important work of your whole life. Uh, no one's paying you for it, but anyway what are we talking uh okay yeah so just the holy spirit comes and gives us the strength to work and it's good if you have work that doesn't have it's, it seems unimportant to you and and meaningless and whatnot number one remember what luther's talking about through vocation number two so it's the person that matters and the work that the person makes that work uh holy and acceptable in god's sight but then number two, it's oftentimes that we end up in a job or a career precisely because it pays more, and it. But the the equivalent of meaning and purpose is not there, and we recognize that we're here to love our, and serve our neighbors, so that the financial concerns are only one of the many concerns that factor into it. So it's okay to think about that kind of stuff. It's okay to have a job that doesn't pay as much, but has more meaningful work. I mean, check with your wife first, but <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so he's working hard like crazy. So Laban, so Luther says how how hard he was working that Laban wants to pay him, who was kind of a scoundrel. And also, we have this understanding that Laban was not a he was not successful. Like Jacob leaves the the estate of Abraham and Isaac, which would have been massive. I mean, lots of herds. Lots of property, lots of wealth. Abraham, I mean, Abraham was a wealthy man, but he didn't have any land wealth, but he had all these flocks. He was like a king. He had armies, but he could rouse armies. 
And here Laban doesn't have anything. When Jacob leaves him, he's going to say, uh, you didn't have anything when I came to you. So he's, um, so here's then again, Jacob out of nothing. He's working like crazy. Uh, to such a man, you could entrust the care and administration of household affairs. There's a sense that being a uh, part of part of being a Christian, and part of our study and training as a Christian, is to make us also good for the world. So you remember these things like, uh, well, think of Joseph, Jacob's son, who goes down to Egypt and becomes an administrator in all of Egypt, or think of Daniel in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. There's, a, there's wisdom also to govern and to rule that comes through our understanding of the Ten Commandments. There's this line where, where is this? I'm looking in the Book of Concord now. At the very end of the large catechism. Um, the brief exercise right here. Um uh, Uh, maybe this is not it. I, the, therefore, it's, it, here's Luther's summary of the large catechism. Maybe even before this. Uh, it's clearly useless to try to change old people. <laughs> we cannot perpetuate these and other teachings unless we train the people who come after us and succeed us in our office and work so that they in turn may bring up their children successfully. Thus, the word of God and the Christian church will be preserved. Therefore, let every head of a household remember that it is his duty by God's injunction and command to teach or have taught to his children the things they ought to know. Since they are baptized and received into the Christian church, they should also enjoy this fellowship of the sacrament so that they may serve us. That's, that's stronger in other places. Aren't? And be useful. For they must all help us to believe, to love, to pray, and to fight against the devil. This is our Christian life. Believe, love, pray, fight the devil. I, Luther's probably thinking, believe, creed, love, Ten Commandments, pray, Lord's Prayer, fight the devil, sacraments, and spiritual warfare. So, so we have to train the children so they may serve us and be useful, so that the Christian is a useful person. It should be that when you're, for example, applying for the job, and the person hears that you're a Christian and that you learn the catechism, be like, oh, good. Uh, I know you'll be wise and work hard. I don't know if that's the case or not. It seems like the world is going the other way because the Christian church is despised, but this is, should be the case. Uh, the statement, you had little before I came to you. Oh, yeah, that's what Luther says. Oh, Jacob says to Laban. At the same time, God's blessing for the sake of the faithful servant was added. The servant was really the salvation and the pillar of that household. Therefore, I do not want you to serve me for nothing, says Laban, for he sees that Jacob is not a lazy beast like the servants and maids we have today, but that he did more for the profit and advantage of his uncle than had been commanded. Accordingly, the reward for such faithful service follows. Verse 16. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Someone can pay, can compare Luther's translation over here with the ESV over here, or New King James over here, and tell me what differences you see in the chat. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful and lovely. Jacob loved uh, Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And this is nice. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. So Laban says, well, how can I pay you? And, and Jacob says, hey, I've got my eye on Rachel. I'd like to work. And this is not like, I just like to marry her, but I'll work for seven years. And then get married to her. <laughs> Luther, this is altogether childish and carnal. For what does it mean that this very saintly man who was adorned by God with such great promises and to whom God himself appeared in a very clear vision becomes young again at this age and nearly returns to boyhood. Remember that Jacob is 77 or 78, something like this, 80 years old. And that he looks and he says, boy, Rachel, your youngest daughter, she's beautiful. 
I want to marry her. It's like a, you know, it's like the teenage boy. And Luther says, what's going, how could, it seems like you'd outgrow that kind of thing when you, no, he sees two maidens, one more beautiful than the other. Of these, he loves the one who's outstanding because of her beauty. The other one he does not love. Uh, this does not seem proper for an octogenarian Jacob, does it? For he's certain at this time he had reached the age of 80 or at least 78. But at this age, he begins for the first time to dally like a youngster and to love. <laughs> Why well, pray, does the Holy Spirit record such things and set them before us to be read as though we should be edified by such a disgraceful deed? For what's more, it'll be stated below that Jacob loved his son Joseph because Joseph was born when Jacob was an old man. Huh. And this is this time was not more than 14 years distant. Nevertheless, it's called Jacob's old age. Therefore, it, it is not proper for such a saintly man to be so foolish and lustful that he looks at a maiden's beauty and loves a beautiful one more than he loves one who is ugly. For one cannot say that he did so out of love for offspring, since, and this is funny for Luther, since for the most part, ugly women are more fertile, as is clear in the case of Leah. <laughs> But by no childbearing could she bring it about that she was loved as much by Jacob as Rachel was loved. Therefore, he cannot be excused on the pretext of seeking offspring, but is simply droll and ridiculous to love a maiden because of her beauty, not for the sake of offspring. So, so this is the kind of thing that the young men worry about. And Luther says, but look, he's Jacob's, he's 80. <laughs> by rights, of course, we should love the female sex simply for the sake of offspring and procreation. It was created by God to serve this purpose, not for us to misuse it merely to satisfy lust. So Luther says that especially he's, and remember he's teaching in the seminary, so he's teaching men who are going to be pastors. So it's why he's teaching, it's mostly is teaching to the men and not to the women. But he says that our love is a family love, not a lustful love. So that it embraces the whole of family, sex itself is embracing the whole of family. So it's not just a satisfying for us, but for a greater purpose. The structure of a woman's whole body bears this out quite magnificently, I'll add. It has its own organs and members with which to conceive, to nourish, and carry the fetus. But few consider this, and Jacob too strays from this purpose. For he loves Rachel because of her beauty, and he does not love Leah, who is less beautiful. Yet uh, it is less seemly for old men than for youths to look at beauty. But this should be taught and dealt with in the church, lest we shrink from marriage. Th thus the papists, the Roman Catholic Church, have debased and condemned with their irrational babbling. For the Holy Spirit records this to give evidence that God does not reject and condemn even those who look at beauty in a wife, and that such a choice is without sin. Therefore, no one should think that he is committing a sin if he prefers a beautiful woman to one who is ugly, as he's getting ready to get married and so forth. Thus, this too teaches and edifies us. Furthermore, Jacob hoped for offspring from a woman of outstanding beauty and strength of body. For when contracting marriages, the strong should be chosen and united with the strong, the industrious with the industrious, etc. I've always thought this curious how and I don't know how this happens, but how people do end up matching up in this way. Thus, this distinction is observed among dumb brutes, oxen, horse, sheep, roosters, all other animals. But because of the corruption resulting from original sin, it does not happen this way among us, among men. For this is why it happens that some are born strong, others weak, sometimes leprous, sometimes blind, sometimes feeble-minded because of the fault and guilt of the parents. Therefore, one must bear it that, a strong, that strong persons are united with those who are weak on account of original sin, and this evil must be counteracted with the remedy of matrimony shown by God, no matter how they are united or who they are. So, so Luther's saying, just to get the whole plot here, uh, and this is kind of vintage Luther, but he says, look, if we're just looking at things how they should be, we want to match people up who match, but it doesn't happen. People get carried away. This person falls in love with this person who, who knows if they should marry. And then, and Luther says, but God seems to be all right with it. <laughs> he does like the way that Jacob looks at, at Rachel instead of Leah, he would, it would have been reasonable to say, well, I'll marry Leah. She's the oldest. She should be married first. She's suitable as a wife, etc." And Jacob says, 
nope, I'm, I'm drawn to this Rachel. I want to marry her, even though I'm 80. She's more beautiful to me. And the Lord says, fine. But Laban doesn't. I mean, Laban says, fine. But then he, you know, pulls the old switcheroo. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Uh, <laughs> this is interesting. Animals have their fixed time for procreation. I'm no rancher, but as a result of the poison of original sin, man alone has irregular and unfixed impulses, which could not be taken care of in any other way than by means of this union, where he who can have a wife who is beautiful and whose strength is unimpaired should have her by all means. He who cannot have a choice should marry the one who is offered, whether she's beautiful or not. Uh, it, it, this is Luther, but just most of the history of the church, the basic structure of humanity is marriage. Uh, furthermore, after original sin, marriage is decidedly troublesome and burdensome to the flesh because the union is indissoluble. Uh, for although passion and the love of sex for sex, this should be like man for woman uh, or woman for man. So the love of sex for sex remains. Yet that bond concerning which Moses says that a wife should be an inseparable companion for life in the eyes of her husband is very hard and difficult. For no matter what calamity befalls either their bodies, their property, or their offspring, that firm and indissoluble bond remains, and every choice is removed, nor is any change, any rejection, or repudiation permitted. Marriage is, boom, you're locked in. At least you're supposed to be. I mean, this idea of, I, I don't, I just imagine what Luther would say about our culture of divorce and how he would react to that. It's just, whew. but it comes as a, as this, as a blessing that the Lord gives, but it also comes as a burden. Uh, you're bound up together forever. We, uh, every choice is removed. Uh, this is in the marriage vows. We say forsaking all others remain united to you alone. So long as we both shall live. So that forsaking all others. And I pledge to you my faithfulness. The old way that they would say it is, I plight thee my troth. I pledge you my truth. I plight thee my troth. I pledge to you my faithfulness. I am trying to convince some couples to use that language in their wedding. But no one wants to plight their troth. They just want to pledge their faithfulness. But anyway. Uh, on top of this, the devil, the foe of all the ordinance of God, puts in his appearance. He troubles and torments married people in various ways. True enough. Because of so many great troubles and difficulties of marriage, it's not wicked if one chooses a beautiful woman with her bodily strength unimpaired in order that he may be able to endure this bond of marriage with all its troubles longer and more easily. Nor is it advisable to choose a woman who is odious and troublesome at the very beginning. For Satan is wont to alienate and tear apart even those whose beauty is outstanding and who embrace each other with the greatest of love. So remember, and especially in these days, in previous days of arranged marriage, what is romance? What is affection? What is love? What does attraction have to do with any of it? Luther says it's great. Uh, it's not the only question, but it's great. Uh, I see uh, Krista says in the chat that talking about grandparents married because of they had an arranged marriage. She said, we married and I grew to love him. So you don't start with love, you get there. One way or the other. You can start with love and get there. Or you can start with love and stay there. Or you can, you don't have to, but you can get there. It's great. Here the Holy Spirit teaches that such a choice has not been condemned by God. He commends it or yields to the wish of this very saintly patriarch in order that he may love a beautiful woman more than one who is ugly. He, God, he, Holy Spirit, lets it happen. For marriage is the kind of life that has need of the remission of sins and the indulgence of God, so that, not, so that God not only convenes at such lust, provided that it is lawful through marriage, but also at the mistakes and offenses of domestics, of children, of married couples, which are wont to occur in the management of household affairs. So there's a, the, the idea here is that, that, that God knows that we're so, filled with sin that there's a like he's there's allowances that he makes 
Should a person's personal attractiveness matter? Should it be that someone who is more attractive is, is more desirable or less desirable? No, that's, that, that should not be the way that we factor things in. But what does the Lord say about it? He says, well, okay, fine, fine. For just as it's necessary for the state and the church to be under the remission of sins, so the life of married people is also under the indulgence of God and the remission of sins. God does not want those conjugal matters to be condemned, namely, that a husband chooses and loves a beautiful wife. Although, convines means connives, connives, sorry. Thank you. Uh, connives is to, uh, like to permit. Uh, how do it was uh, the definite? It's like, um, it's, yeah, to allow, to like allow an exception or something like that. Someone can maybe look that up for me on the dictionary. A uh, husband chooses and loves a beautiful wife. Although in the beginning, this is not difficult. In the first fervor of the love with which the bridegroom and bride are mutually aglow, the honeymoon stage, Yet it gradually cools down. Indeed, at times it degenerates after a month into exceedingly sharp hatred at the instigation of the devil, who bewitches the heart of married people in various and strange ways. Now, this is an important thing to recognize, that the devil hates marriage, and the devil is uh, always fighting against marriage. If you're married, you, sh you should know it. And if you don't know that, then I'm, I'm telling you. And it's a weird, so just even this, like of all the times, so there's been lots of times as a pastor where I've, I've had to tell people, they're telling me a story or they're struggling with something. And I'll say, okay, you have an enemy. That person is your enemy. They're thinking, they think of you like their enemy. And most of the time it's to married couples that they become enemies of one another. A, it's, it's a horrible thing to see. But what happens when someone is your enemy is that means anything good that they do, you take as bad. And then every single act becomes a sin. It's an amazing thing. But to, you got to see it clearly for what it is. And it's because the devil, like Luther says here, the devil is after it. The devil hates. And, and there's a weird thing that happens be, be, before marriage versus after marriage. So the devil's strategy is totally different for, for the single people and for people who are dating, uh, maybe even engaged people, than the people who are uh, uh, who are married. In fact, in fact, very simply, the you know the devil's always trying to push unmarried people into bed, and he's always trying to pull married people out of bed. It's crazy. You could never, you could never have convinced me that that is the case when before I got married. But and I, I when I explained that to the couples who are like tempted to live together or who are tempted to act married before they get married. They, it's, it's just kind of a mind blowing thing. But when I'm meeting with the couples who are married already, this is the problem. You know, it's been, you know, that, that there's a coldness towards one another. So, so the devil attacks in various different ways. This means we we're engaging in spiritual warfare and maybe can say this very clearly that for the single people, uh, Chastity, your chastity is spiritual warfare. And for the married people, your intimacy is spiritual warfare. This is, this is how it goes. Because, and, but here's the main thing is that the devil is attacking. Accordingly, mm, I wonder how, 47, yeah, yeah, let's do a couple more paragraphs because I'd love to clear out this chapter here. This, of course, is not an, uh, uh, excuse for the sin, which the hypocrites censure in the patriarch, but it's praise of the indulgence of God. He does not condemn this rejection of Leah, who is less beautiful, and the choice of the other, who is more beautiful. The papers explain his wantonness. They don't see what reason has driven him to matrimony. For concern of descendants weighs on Jacob, who has the promise. He's apprehensive about getting a suitable and pleasing wife, rather than finding an, a fixed abode and house. This is contrary to all the reasons of the philosophers and the precepts of wise men. Hesiod says, first a house, a wife, and an ox for plowing. Here our Jacob is concerned about none of these, not about a house, not about an ox, not about the other necessities, but first of all, he chooses a wife. What do we say? We have Hesiod. We say, first 
a college degree, then a career, then a house, then a wife or whatever. Forgot about it. Furthermore, the papers do not even see that the outstanding chastity is concealed under his youthful love. The Holy Spirit not only does not condemn the mutual love of the bridegroom and the bride per se, but at the same time, he points out especially how chaste Jacob was. Or is this not outstanding chastity? When a man lives contentedly and chastely up to his 80th or 84th year, for Jacob became a husband for the first time when he was 84 years old, he lived for so long a time as a celibate after the first flower of his age up to the years of his old age, for 14 years later, he will be called an old man. Therefore, if the papists look at the fact that he chose a beautiful maiden, why do they not also see that he lived contentedly up to his 84th year? At that time, nature was stronger and more perfect, so that a man was capable of procreating when he was about 15 or 16 years old. To endure and conquer that wickedness of the flesh and law of the members, which is called lust, from that year on in the very flower of one age is certainly a great miracle and a very fierce fight against the flesh. Few have withstood it. Therefore, the papists stray very far from the truth if they think the fathers lived carnal lives as they surely think. For it's their opinion that no one but the celibate monks and nuns live a chaste life, and it offends them very gravely that the patriarchs were married. They have no understanding whatever of this exceptional chastity of the men. It would not have been strange if during such a long period of countenance, Jacob had completely mortified his flesh and destroyed his innate power to procreate. For the years of his boyhood, youth, and manhood have now elapsed, and now he's 84 years old. He struggled with his flesh for 68 years. Yet desire remained in him, and the inclination toward sex, toward the young maiden, and indeed toward the more beautiful one, whom he, an old man with gray hair, prefers to the one who is less beautiful. Therefore, these examples of chastity surpass all our countenance, and especially the altogether impure celibacy of the papists and the monasteries, which are now mere brothels. This is the indictment of the monasteries in the medieval world. Or even if they had preserved chastity, it's not to be compared to the chastity of the fathers in whom the flesh was mortified in such a way with great faith and spirit that the natural inclination toward the affection for the other sex was nevertheless not extinguished. Thus Jacob loves his bride with a true love to an extraordinary degree, so that those seven years barely seem to equal a period of three or seven days. <laughs> He's so He loved Rachel, was so excited about this wedding. Oh! Furthermore, what is most important of all, after he had become a bridegroom, he waits seven years until he's united to his bride. If today anyone had to wait so many years for his wedding day, in the meantime had to serve as a pauper and a beggar, he would surely abandon both his bride and his father-in-law. Those papal swine do not consider this. Nor do they see the illustrious and invaluable example of chastity, which at the same time is coupled with such wonderful patience for seven whole years to endure the servitude and delay the certainty would be intolerable for any other man. Besides, he's wretched and poor. He has nothing of his own, not even a shoe strap or a thread. He does it all out of love for a maiden, love by which he was captivated to such an extent that those seven years seem to be only days. That is, as if they had been no more than seven days. It's fantastic. Um, good. We better stop. I think I will stop there. Uh, this is a, a kind of a beautiful spot, but he's going to go, he's going to... Um, He's going to lean into why this is. He quotes Augustine. He's going to press back against Augustine. He's going to go and do some grammar stuff, especially what does it mean that that um, Leah's eyes were delicate or weak? Uh, what was going on there? The beauty of Rachel, and etc. And then and then we have the old switcheroo that's coming up next. Good. Um. Good. I'm just checking the chat to see if there's anything I want to put. Since God, someone said, since God spends much attention on marriage, it's at the top of the priority of living and faith and life. Exactly. True about Satan and his schemes. Yep, exactly. Uh, son has been married four months. Going to worship at the Lord's table together helps prolong the honeymoon period. True enough. That's great. Well, let's close with prayer and then we'll uh, stop the recording and jump on and have a conversation. If you're, by the way, if you're watching this video later, then uh, jump on with us live on Wednesday morning. It's great. Wolfmuller.co slash Bible is uh, where to find the info and how to, how to join us live. But let's pray. 
Well, Lord, we thank you for your kindness and mercy and love for us in Christ, that you look upon us, not according to our works, but according to your gift of faith, the grace that you give to us in your promise of forgiveness, that you delight even in our most humble works. We pray for the single that you would grant them a chastity and patience, marriage according to their desire and your will. We pray for the married, that you would protect them from all the assaults of the devil, that they, husband and wife would rejoice in one another and your gift of family. Uh, we give you thanks for, uh, for Jacob and for providing him also a family so that your promise of the seed who would destroy the devil uh, would come to pass in the birth and death and resurrection of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And for him and all this, we give you thanks. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.